John Lonius. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much, Julie. It's a pleasure having you here. Now, you're joining me from Missouri, is that correct? St. Louis, Missouri. Yes, ma'am. Gateway to the West. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm up here in Canada. So yeah, it's, it's really interesting to have you on the show because as a Canadian, I got all my education about Canadian history, correct? So I don't know a whole lot about the things, the kinds of things that you specialize in, which is fun for me, believe it or not. I love learning new things and I love learning about American history because you're our neighbor. So uh, you uh, you have your essentially you're you're a quite I, I would imagine quite busy with a variety of projects. Uh, you work in media. You have written a book about the the life of Charles Parsons, who um, uh, we will discuss very soon. Uh, what else do you do? Uh, well, so my background spans government, education, technology, and all forms of media. And, uh, you know, I just I, I, I love nature and to connect the fact that that you're in Canada, the my family on my mother's side actually were all from Nova Scotia, originally from England and then, then came to Nova Scotia and then came down into the, uh, you know, the lower United States. And uh, and that's how it all kind of started. <laughs> that's so fascinating. Uh, we talked about this via email at one point, too, uh, because I, my girlfriend and I are planning on moving to the east coast of Canada. And this is how we I learned a little bit about your own your own history, which is fascinating that you have a connection to Canada. Mm -hmm. So I guess it is a even better fit for the podcast in, in a way. <laughs> um, so do you use like, uh, when people ask you, you know, John, what do you do for a living? What do you tell them? Well, I say, I, I say that I'm a media executive, and uh, I'm does does Canada have Panera Bread? Um, I'm not sure. Okay. Well, um, well, so so what I get to do uh, on a daily basis, which I absolutely love, is I get to work with uh, brands from all around the planet. Uh, some of the names that maybe the American audiences would know are, are Panera Bread, um, Goddard Schools, uh, obviously larger companies like Boeing, Lockheed Martin, groups like that. But we have a chance to, to work with Fortune 100 and Fortune 500 clients all over the planet, creating videos and storytelling and, you know, really, you know, share stories. Of, of what's happening with the brand and, and it's fantastic uh you know before we went live here a minute ago we talked a little bit about podcasting and radio and i started my career originally in radio professionally in the early 90s and had a chance to uh, come up through through those particular ranks and then around the mid 90s training myself as a writer producer director of video and so you know it's it's just enjoyable now to be able to tap into different uh, experiences uh, and really you know be able to have a conversation with anybody just like right now yeah, it's funny that you say that because uh, I interviewed a scientist who was formerly a uh, British journalist. And so, you know, the first time that happened, I was quite intimidated. I'm, I'm a podcaster. I have no experience in media, you know, uh, prior to this uh, podcast. So uh, I will try to not be intimidated while interviewing somebody who works in media, of course. <laughs> not at all. You have an amazing voice and, a, and an incredible presence. So let's just have some fun over the next, you know, short of an hour. That sounds good. That sounds good. Uh, John, one of the reasons I wanted to have you on the show, I know you're not a, you know, like a PhD historian, but you do know a lot about the American Civil War that um, I think even most Americans don't know about. So I wanted to really get a bit of a primer, if that's all right with you, on the Civil War. Is that is that good? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so... Um, <laughs> I'm going to ask you the dumb questions because I really don't know a whole lot. I've seen a lot of movies that might, um, you know, be about the Civil War or might have a, you know, thematic kind of uh, approach to it. I wanted to know what was it that prompted the Civil War? My understanding is that it was over slavery. Is that, is that correct? Well, yes, yeah, slavery was obviously a, a big, a big part of the American Civil War. So we can look to the Kansas-Nebraska Act. So as the United States was developing their states, Missouri, for example, where I am now, came into the Union in 1821. Uh, William Grimes Pettus was the first Secretary of State for Missouri, who actually happens to be Charles Parsons' father-in-law. So as we segue back to the book and talking about the uh, the uh, 
the connection to the American Civil War, we may revisit that. But um, what was happening is that prior to the Kansas-Nebraska Act, um, there were states vying for uh, whether they were going to be a free state or a slave state. And essentially, all of the southern states, not, not all of them, but I mean, m many of the southern states in the United States at the time, and, and obviously um, America was not finished with, with creating all their states, um, you know, you're looking at a, at, at, a, at a particular part of the country uh, where, you know, the ability to, to grow crops and very large amount of crops needed a, a lot of people to do that. So these states in the South, for the most part, you know, were supporting slavery and, and an entire um, uh, economy grew up around slave labor and, and uh, you know, using, you know, people in, in that way to, to grow economies. And so what began to happen and of course, I'm being very broad. So for for for, for you Civil War uh, historians who are really listening, you know, to, uh, to 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 the nuances of this, is that I'm 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 being very broad to, to be able to tell the story very quickly. But you began. Yeah, and that's the purpose of, of of the question. Was really a broad stroke here. <laughs> yeah. So it's like it's it's basically that you had the northern states that had been formed. And the southern states that had been formed, and the union, the the federal government was attempting to keep it equal. And so as, as things started to develop, like Kansas and, and Nebraska and Missouri and Iowa and all of these other states, it's, it, it began to be a point to where that slavery was going to uh, be the dominant economy in the United States. And a lot of people were asking the question for a very long time, so, you know, is this really what we want to do? And so that that began to build the tensions and the hostility around you know, essentially getting rid of slavery and playing out during the American Civil War. OK, so people were asking the questions. Um, I guess it would it, would it be fair to say that they were asking just because it was like a modernization of like the social structure that was happening? Was it because they just, you know, uh, some 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 violence happened? What, what was it that really started prompting that question? Well, it, you, you, saw, you saw kind of two things happening. One, it was states' rights. It's like, you know, for us as Missouri, do we have the right to say we're going to be a slave state or not? Or is it the federal government, which doesn't necessarily involve itself in our affairs, do they have domain over this? So in, in many ways, the American Civil War was to, quote unquote, you know, solve the question, who really ultimately is in charge? And if you ask the United States federal government today, they'll say that the Civil War solved that. If you ask some of the states in the United States, they'll say this question still, is, still isn't even solved today in, in 2021. So the importance of the American Civil War and studying it is really that you are seeing things play out today that are 160 year old conversations like e even if we go back to January 6 and, and we look at what happened at the US Capitol where you had people flying confederate flags and even though what we think of as the confederate flag the x with the stars and the and the red in the background you know that that's not the that's not the true confederate flag which is interesting that the flag that is shown and associated with with southern hostilities was a battlefield flag but the point for sharing that is that what's interesting is that when you look at books like confederates in the attic and i can't remember who the author is but look that up it's fascinating to see that Though the Civil War ended, you know, in the 1860s, in, in the mid 1860s, some of those conversations are still alive today. So the the study of the American Civil War and the understanding of it uh, really begins to play out in in modern day conversations very appropriately. Yeah, it's actually one of the one of the reasons why I wanted to have you on the show is because I think that in order to understand modern day, you have to understand the past, right? I mean, it, that's a golden rule. 
uh, of social studies, and I think just in in uh, in being a person who's educated. Uh, and so, one of the things I don't understand as a Canadian is the really the symbolism of the Confederate flag. You just said that it you, it was actually the the flag that we saw in Washington recently, and, and that we see on people's cars or whatever. That's not an actual Confederate flag. Can you explain that for me, and what uh, what's the symbolism behind it? Well, it, it it is a Confederate flag in in the sense of that it would be used as a battle flag. So if we use uh, a a Japanese analogy for a moment, is that in Japan, you know, each family in Japan up until the Edo period had their own particular family crest or symbol. And so if you were on the battlefield and you wanted to know which clan was about to attack you, you would go and look at the flag bearer to see who what, what, you know which family or which clan was 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 coming at you. Same thing with the American Civil War in that you had units, some units that were just kind of, you know, organizing themselves locally. Some of them that you know that were organizing through the actual uh, Confederate States Army. And so it gave it gave you your group and also others an opportunity to see okay you're associated with this group. You're associated with that group. What's interesting about the the Confederate flag that most people talk about, again, the X with the stars and the, and the orange color, uh, that, that, that was not the actual Confederate States flag. Uh, that one's difficult to explain verbally, so I would just say look it up. But What's what's interesting is that because of modern day media in the United States, uh, shows like uh, the Dukes of Hazard, um, and to your point earlier about other you know movies that you may have seen, is that you know this particular image gets caught in the in the popular culture, and in reality during that time it wasn't necessarily that important of an image, but now it's associated with Southern rights. It's associated with, you know, a whole slew of things, positive and negative, depending on, okay. depending on. So, your, yeah. Yeah. It really sounds like something that just caught got caught in popular culture and now <laughs> became a, a symbolism for, for really a certain theme. Um, so the civil war is between pretty much the Southern states and the Northern states, if I'm understanding this correctly. Correct. And how does it actually break out? Like who takes the first shot? How does this unfold? So it, it, well, it, it's, it starts um, with the battle of Fort Sumner. And essentially what happens is that uh, the, the locals in, in, in Fort Sumner, which was a federal facility that had been built um they bombed it. And then uh, essentially overnight, you know, Lincoln says, OK, well, we're, we're at war. And then you quickly begin to see uh, that the Confederate states form their own government. Uh, and I mean, literally a stone's throw from from the United States Capitol. Uh, and then you, you see skirmishes begin to play out, you know, factions beginning to to organize themselves. And then you have battles like Gettysburg and uh, other of the more famous battles. But for, for the most part, the Civil War very early on was fought mostly on the East Coast of the United States. If we were gonna take Missouri, for example, people don't realize that Missouri was the third most uh, uh, place where battles were fought during the Civil War, but different from large armies walking at each other in, in, lar in large lines, as you may have seen in movies, most of the fighting in Missouri, for example, was guerrilla warfare. Interesting. So what was going on in California at the time? Uh, really not much. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I mean, I mean you, you know, so General William T. Sherman, uh, who you may have heard of, uh, who was General Grant, then later President Grant's right-hand person. Uh, you know, uh, you had William T. Sherman in California in the 1850s, who basically, after a group of soldiers find this really shiny gold-colored rock, i.e. real gold, uh, and they send it back to, you know, uh, the United States Capitol, suddenly they want to turn California into a state. And so because of the distances between many of the East Coast you know, states and California, which is darn near 6,000 miles, um, you know, though the last, the, the last true, true battle uh, of the Civil War, months after the surrender, 
actually took place in California, it's one of those things that is not talked about very often. So again, you're looking at the proximity of the 19th century uh, and people's ability to travel long distances, which you know, horseback obviously was common. Walking was clearly common. Uh, the fastest mode of transportation at that time uh, was railroad. And what's interesting is that the South and the North had different size gauges of rail. So that's one way that you knew the difference between the North and the South was in the gauge difference of the Northern rails and the Southern rails. What is a gauge? Uh, so, so like the distance between the two rails that are, are on a uh, railroad, uh, oh, okay. the North had wider where the Southern ha- was actually shorter. So a- again, from a, from a strategic standpoint, uh, from, from a military standpoint is that if I'm heading South and I want to know, well, where does the South begin? And I may not have a very good map. If I looked at the, if I looked at the size of the railroad tracks from the North of the United States and the South of the United States, I would clearly know where the South began. Okay, okay. So that, that that's really interesting. I definitely did not know that. Um, and I was, uh, maybe, you know, the majority of Americans don't even know that either. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, do you, do you right. find that you encounter, you know, people who just don't know much about this, this era? Well, yes and no. I mean, I think I, it's, it's interesting to me when you talk about what people know about the Civil War, it's kind of what mostly today a, a lot of people report is that, you know, we have gotten so used to watching television and movies uh, that we start to believe what we see. And we forget that those are oftentimes the invention of a screenwriter, you know, making a story work. And that's why, for me, one of the best uh, recommendations I make for any young person is read a book that has at least. 20 references that you actually researched it. I mean, we live in a world now where, you know, people believe social media and we're finding out more and more every day that that's not, this isn't true or that's not true or that's not fully true. And so, you know, the, the, I think the importance of really educating people, I think the best thing we still have are books. I agree. I agree. I am curious though, are there any films that you can think of that actually really do kind of um, you know, are are accurate in terms of referencing the the, the Civil War. I th- I think that there are many. I mean, the nice thing about the Civil War movies that we've seen, again, for the most part, is that since the Civil War is actually one of the most researched and studied uh, modern day uh, conflicts, battles, war, whatever you want to call it, uh, for the most part, those are accurate. Now, if the movie was made. That say, for example, you know, by a Southern sympathizer, well, obviously you're going to see a little bit of a different take than if it was made by a filmmaker in New York who may be, you know, more prone to telling the Union story versus the Confederate Southern story. Right. Of course, that makes sense. Right. I mean, everybody's got their different perspectives and, and you know, heritage and, and all that stuff. I've heard that the film Lincoln is really good. I haven't seen it. It's, it's on my, my bucket list. Yeah, I, I I really enjoyed Lincoln. Um, I really uh, the I, I don't know if you if if Canada gets the History Channel uh, that's here in the United States, but recently there was um, a, a whole a mini series on Grant, which was it was good. Um, it wasn't great, but it was really good. And I, I think the point for these kinds of shows is to ignite people's excitement. And actually going out and doing their own research. I mean, I, I I can tell Julie that you're the type of person that values doing your own research and finding out things for yourself. Yeah, I mean, that's why I have this podcast, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so, okay, so now now we've gotten to the point where the people are, you know, rioting. They're 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 being violent towards each other. Uh, I, I, so question of curiosity, are they, what are they fighting with? Are, are they using muskets? Are they, you, you mentioned a bomb earlier. Uh, how, how is this actually playing out? Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's playing out oftentimes hand to hand knives, you know, small arms, uh, whether it's rifles, right. Keep in mind that still during the 19th century, 
uh, though there were some shooters that could shoot at a far distance, uh, the amount of time it would take uh, to be able to reload, uh, you know, a, a, a rifle of that time uh, would take about three and a half minutes. So if you're using a, a one shot, you know, uh, rifle and you've got three and a half minutes essentially to, to, you know, to reload it, you're going to either a do what they used to do where they would line three soldiers up. One would shoot and then pass back the weapon to the person behind him who would then either start the packing process and get that going while another rifle was coming up and being presented to the superior shooter or if you run out of ammunition, well, you've got your bayonet and you're going to have to, you know, fight hand to hand or, you know, with, with a knife or throw a rock. Uh, keep in mind that even though the federal government uh, was fairly uh, well armed, that early on they weren't. And so you had the Confederate states uh, that, that were using or the Confederate soldiers that were using shotguns or whatever, whatever weapons were available to them that they may have had on the farm. And so the, the point that I'm making or hoping that I'm making is that the reason why the, the Civil War sticks out for people pretty poignantly is that you would literally see the whites of their eyes. And uh, unlike modern day warfare, where if I have a 50 caliber Browning sniper rifle, I can, you know, shoot you from, you know, two and a half miles away. You know, you're really in a battle for your life, hand to hand, face to face. Um, and that's the brutality of it. I mean, you know, you, you had a, uh, you had Gen General Sherman talking about how war is hell and, you know, people that, that had never seen any kind of battles like this before. Obviously, they weren't watching television in the early 1860s. So all of a sudden, they find themselves on a battlefield, all excited to, you know, to to be engaged in what they think is going to be this this exciting and glamorous and glorious experience. And all of a sudden, people are falling around them and dying, or they're or they're literally being stabbed and cut right right next to them and so it becomes a extremely gruesome battle um and in many cases some of the soldiers didn't even know what they were fighting for that's why i asked the question you know because people must have been like why is she asking about the guns who cares actually i do care because it it takes a very strong kind of hatred like you said to be able to see the whites of of the eyes of of your so called enemy and to 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 hear their children you know crying and and all these things i mean this is a very very brutal act of violence here that we're talking about and and in the case like you said where they really don't know what they're fighting for or against is is mind boggling mind boggling to a modern uh you know adult who has never been in that situation i mean to me that's it's that's outrageous i can't even fathom the idea of hitting someone outside of perhaps a boxing ring for example um but one thing that I'm really curious about, and this is kind of a bit of an aside, but I do understand that the Cherokee Nation is near Missouri, if I if I understand correctly. Were they involved in this uh, civil war? How, how did that um, play out? Yeah, so there were reports of Native American Indians being involved and working with the government. Unfortunately, by the time that the Civil War uh, is beginning to play itself out, uh, the U.S. federal government has done a very, very, very good job of removing indigenous people from the, the, the states that are being developed or in places where they want to develop states. So you've heard of the Trail of Tears, possibly? Mm -hmm. Yes, and yes. So that, you know, really that's moving, you know, indigenous, you know, peoples from uh, the United, I mean, not the United States, but for them, I mean, from their land and moving them to, to reservations that were for the most part fairly and far away from the conflict of the American Civil War. Um, you know, as someone who has studied uh, a great deal of history, and I have a, a, a deep connection to the indigenous peoples of what we would now call the United States and that history, it's it is such a horrible and sad, sad story 
about what we have glossed over and what we did in the in the name of quote America or in the name of you know colonization, whatever words you want to use for that. Um, but it, you know we know that prior to uh, the white man coming to the come coming to America, you know over five hundred languages were spoken a, a, across what would become the United States. And uh, I'm I'm going a little bit off topic, but but the point is is that in some cases uh, there were you know Native American Indians who would side either with the the southern states because they saw that they were fighting against an enemy that was common to them or then in some cases they would uh, you know american indians would side with the union thinking that okay if this is going to be the power structure let me see how i can really um you know align myself for my own self-preservation um on which on both sides is unfortunate circling back to one of the generals of the civil war that you know is lauded in a lot of ways general sherman would say that the only good indian is a dead indian and he was he kept his promise when he was in florida he destroyed you know uh the native population there when his brother who was either a senator or a congressman, I can't remember, but when his brother wanted to build a railroad all the way across the United States, it was Sherman and the Union Army that killed over three million buffalo. And not just, not not killed them for the meat, just literally just killed them to get them out of the way so the railroad could be built, so there could be one unified railroad across the entire country and if you go online and look at these that look at these photos of of you know uh buffalo and bison skull uh quite literally stacked 40 feet in the air you know it's it, it, as a historian though, though as you pointed out though I'm not a PhD historian as somebody who you know has really sought to look at all different types of history not just you know white history but like looking at indigenous people history and 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 asian history and you know uh it's it it it's amazing to me the sad stories that exist all over the planet that people don't talk about this is uh another example of this brutality there's just this intense brutality like if that happened today I mean, we we do have, of course, I mean, we always have incidents of violence today. We have, you know, uh, uprisings. And, and you mentioned earlier the, um, the recent event at the White House. Uh, but it feels like it hasn't gotten to that scale yet. Perhaps it's too fragmented. Perhaps there's just too many people now. I'm not sure. Um, but do you feel a certain sense of, um, I don't know, of luck of being born at this time? Well, I think I think in many ways, but you know, when, when you talk about how you know if if it was happening today, the Holocaust happened in the nineteen you know, like right in, in the nineteen forties, which essentially is you know some eighty some eighty years ago. If we if we look at how during during World War II, uh, Japanese Americans were interred on American soil at essentially concentration camps. I mean, I, I think that there's so much that's going on even now that because the the world, world governments, the media, et cetera, has gotten so good at controlling certain narratives or keeping certain narratives out of the collective, um, I, I would assert that there's a lot of things going on right now that maybe we don't even know about that we might hear about, you know, a, a genocide happening in Africa, you know, that that we, that we saw was happening in the 80s that, you know, we got kind of aware of in in the 90s. I mean, like, I, I just I think there's a lot of things happening always uh, that unfortunately we don't find about uh, we don't find out about until much later. And we don't have anything. We, we can't do anything about that. Right, right. Especially on a, on a worldwide context. I think I, I was referring more to, you know, uh, the context of the United States, for example. Um, I, I know I especially feel lucky to have been born. I mean, I won the lottery. I, I was born in Canada. I mean, you know, <laughs> and I was, you know, and, and uh, born at a time when there's no, no big conflict. There's no, uh, you know, 
thankfully no more residential schools, uh, things like that, you know, where uh, as a Francophone, I have, you know, X number of rights. Uh, so it, it is, a, to me, it's it's important to talk about these things because I, I don't want to see a repeat of them in North America, you know? Yeah. Um, so I'm curious to know, how long did the Civil War last? Uh, it was 1861 to 1865. Wow, four years. Yeah, and but again, going but but circling back to uh, the but circling back to the earlier conversation, even though the Civil War has quote ended, the conversations around states' rights and around you know what you know what was right or wrong about that are is still existing. I want to circle back a, a little yes. bit earlier too about how you were talking about you know are are, are you happy to be living in the time that you are. I, I would say yes. I think what's interesting right now about this time is that, you know, we can have a conversation uh, about different lifestyles. We can have a conversation about different religions. We can have a conversation about a whole number of things. Now, maybe not everybody wants to involve themselves in those conversations, but I think those that do understand the importance of diversity and the importance of, you know, in, in nature, if if a rainforest isn't diverse, it dies. And so when I'm looking at today and I'm looking at my circle of friends and I'm looking at the people that I enjoy, you know, sometimes people are like, how can you be friends with that person? I mean, you seem so divergent from them. And I go, that's my point. You know, it's like the, 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 on one level, we live in an age where we can explore with people, you know, worlds that we may uh, that a hundred years ago nobody talked about or you know would attempt to destroy by any means necessary i really like that analogy of uh the importance of diversity in ecosystems in nature that makes a lot of sense so why not in the human you know with with humans as well right and with diversity of knowledge diversity of of uh of interests that makes a, a lot of sense and i really like that john <laughs> um <laughs> before we get to charles parsons um I want to know what was the catalyst to end, like what ended the war? Well, so what basically is that um, uh, America got tired in many ways of of a war that continued on. I mean, back, you know, back in the, the original thinking when the Civil War broke out was that it was going to be a quick, you know, little conflict, no big deal. But as it went on and quite literally the most number of americans in american history you know would die it 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 became a point where it was like okay how are we going to end this and so lincoln had great pressure to to complete this um you know and and that and and by having the union continue to win battles till finally you know uh, general lee um you know uh surrendered uh, that it, it was very much needed because the country couldn't take any more. Okay. And wasn't it something that, uh, was it Lincoln that just said enough, essentially? Um, yeah. Well, in, in a lot of ways, I mean, he basically told all of his generals just, just to lay waste. And so you, so you had basically general Sherman, for example, there's a, a, there's a campaign called March to the sea, which is an extremely fascinating, uh, experience where Sherman, uh, quite literally cut the, the, uh, um, the communication lines and disappeared into Georgia and, uh, marched across the entire state of Georgia, uh, and then, uh, you know, burned Atlanta to the ground. And so basically they literally were just, you know, it, it's called total war is, is, is the term that's used. And so between Grant and Sherman and some of the other generals just laying waste um, to the southern states. General Lee finally had to say, OK, we surrender, you know, we, we surrender and and, uh, you know, tried to get some some kind of concessions uh, for the south, uh, which, you know, did and did not work. And, um you know, then you kind of stepped into into reconstruction, but it was it was basically in that moment that's when the federal government for themselves solved the question. Listen, we are the ultimate authority in the United States. Nobody has the right or the or or the ability to set up a a different government. You don't have the ability to to secede from the union because we're the ultimate authority. 
Absolutely fascinating. Um, okay, so let's talk about the book that you've written. It's called The Life and Times of Missouri's, or is it Missouri? Is that how you say Missouri? <laughs> so this is so great. <laughs> so I, French. I, I know. I, I I love this. So there are actually about eleven pronunciations <laughs> for and, and for for the state of Missouri, and in and in a week. Uh, of time, Julie, I might meet four people that say it Missouri, Missouri, oh. misery. Uh, but the way that I pronounce it is 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 Missouri, and so it is the life and times of Missouri's Charles Parsons between art and war. Wonderful! Thanks for saying it for me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, out of curiosity, why did you uh, choose this particular fellow? Well, so it's interesting. I, I, you know, there's I think there are things in life that just happen to us that we cannot explain that are supposed to happen. And, and, I, and I will elucidate. <laughs> um, when I was nine years old, I started studying martial arts and also uh, the study of world and Japanese incense. And you might say, well, how did that happen? Well, the, my first martial arts teacher was burning what I would now call bad incense. But uh, I became interested. In, and my mother, who was a bit of a hippie, uh, and my father, who was a military man, you know, basically, my mother said, OK, you have an interest in in martial arts and incense. Let me get you a book on world religions. And I said, why? And she said, well, if you see in the book, you'll notice that every religion someplace in their history has used incense. So if you're Catholic, you might, you know, think of the Catholic incense, like things like frankincense and myrrh. If you're Buddhist, you might think of sandalwood or owl's wood. Uh, even, uh, even Judaism used incense before the fall of, of the second temple. Uh, and I could cite examples of every religion. But so it became fascinating to me that why would really beyond religions, but why would humans have a connection to this? phenomenon called incense that you light and that has a fragrance and has smoke and all of this. So in 2006, uh, I had left a job. I was actually working for the federal government, speaking of that. Uh, and I arrived at Washington University in St. Louis. And I uh, showed up there to be a director of, of training and security. And one of the first things that we did in 2006, after the opening of the museum, that I was tasked with creating the infrastructure for was that the director, the, the director of the museum, Sabina Ekman, wanted to see the remaining collection of Charles Parsons. Now, I didn't know who Charles Parsons was at the time, but Charles Parsons uh, lived 1824 to 1905. He was an influential banker, philanthropist, Civil War colonel, world traveler, author. He was one of the early founders of the American Bankers Association in 1875. He was very good friends with General Sherman that we just talked about. He knew General Grant. He knew Lincoln. His brother, uh, Louis B. Parsons, was best friends with, with, with Lincoln when they would, quote, ride the circuit in Illinois, seeing cases during the 19th century. So, Back to 2006, when all of the collections came out of Charles Parsons, who by the time of his death had actually amassed one of the finest art collections in the world, and originally from New York, came to St. Louis uh, in, in the 19th century, marries into, an, a, 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 marries into an influential family. I mentioned earlier, William Grimes Pettus was the first Secretary of State for Missouri who wrote it into the Union in 1821. Well, that was his father-in-law. So he... He collects a lot of very interesting art that uh, in 1905, when he passes away, he gives it to Washington University in St. Louis for display um, and also for, you know, for study and for perpetuity and then sets up an account where they can buy more art. So I'm getting to my point, I promise. Um, That's all right, go on. <laughs> so, so what was really interesting is that on the table, one of the objects was a Tokugawa incense burner. And if you don't know who or what the Tokugawa are, they were the ruling class of Japan from essentially 1603 till about 1869, essentially. So that's, that, that's the Edo period in Japan. Well, this particular incense burner was mislabeled as a bowl. And having, you know, now studied incense and martial arts for 39 years, I, uh, you know, I walked up to Sabina Ekman and I said, that's not a bowl. And she said, what is it? And I said, that's a Tokugawa incense burner. 
And I talked about some of the iconography and I, I, I go into great detail in chapter nine of the book about this. And I think this is where a book that has the title Missouri becomes an international interest uh, book where what was interesting about Charles Parsons art collection is that he traveled, he made two world travels once in 1870 and then the other was in 1894. And along the way, he's documenting his experiences of 19th century, not just America, but of the world. And he's collecting artifacts along the way. It's not uncommon for museums to mislabel objects, uh, especially from the 19th century and before, if they just don't know. And, you know, clearly incense was not something that is a part of the American culture, Um but it's definitely something a part of the Asian culture, whether it's Chinese or whether it's Japanese, Korean, et cetera. And so not uncommon that you would see things mislabeled. Well, as I started to dig into the collection of Charles Parsons, um, I would see other objects that were mislabeled that I would correct with research and writing essays on it. And the more I got to know the collector, Charles Parsons, the more that I became fascinated in this just incredible life that this man lived. And also that he and I had a lot of things similarly in common, which was uh, which was surprising to me. Um, and so so the book, uh, obviously, The Life and Times of Missouri's Charles Parsons Between Art and War, is about this incredible uh, person who not only collected art, but he used his philanthropy and his success in banking for the common good. And he was one of the people who would work to elect Lincoln because he abhorred slavery. He was like, we, he was, if we're going to continue as a nation, we can't, um, you know, support this institution, which is just horribly destructive uh, to people and families. And so he, he was a progressive of the 19th century as progressive as one could be, because obviously, you know, it takes a long time to make social change and reform. But what's so fascinating about the life and times of Charles Parsons is that there's actually even a, a support for obviously, you know, now what we would, you know, term as LGBTQ, you know, I, a, but he befriended, um, an artist by the name of Harriet Hosmer. Now, in the 19th century, the word lesbian did not exist. Sure, the word lesbos, but but um, you know, in the 19th century, how you might refer to a lesbian during that time was, you know, it would be a mannish woman or a woman who preferred the company of women. That's how it or a spinster, I think, right. is one of the words. Well, exactly. And so the the reason why that I set this up is because. What was interesting about Charles Parsons is that he was as progressive as you could get in the 19th century. And so to use the story, and I, I tell the story uh, in the book, but Harriet Hosmer was the first female sculptor in the world to achieve a claim that is hard to match even today. Her works such as Zenobia and Chains uh, or Inoni uh, are, are these amazing sculptures. And she happened to be you know, uh, a lesbian. And so he, like, he be, he befriended her. He supported her along with Wayman Crow and, and his wife, Martha. And they made sure that she was successful. She trained in Rome. And so this whole life of, of a person that, that passed away in 1905, when you read his life and you look at like the model that he was being during his lifetime from 1824 to 1905, if you applied that lifestyle today with what's happening in the world, I mean, you would change the world. It's so fascinating. Did he leave any letters? Like, was he somebody who wrote a journal? Um, yeah. So he, he actually left a couple of things. One, uh, he wrote a book in 18, well, he released it in 1896, but the book is called Notes of Travel in 1894 and 1895. You can get the book free online because so many people have copied it. Uh, but it's also a book that he, he took his nephew with him around the world in 1894 and took photos of the world in, in 1894. And what's fascinating about the, the entire journal or the account is that you're getting a real good idea about what's happening 
with these cultures in the 19th century, obviously before, you know, television, newspapers were around, but, you know, who really has an interest? If, if you're living in Missouri on a farm, are you really going to take the time necessarily to read about what's happening, you know, in Papua New Guinea or in, you know, any other place on the planet that might seem exotic and foreign? Um, in, in many places in, in his book and from, from 1896, it's almost prophetic. Um, he writes, he writes literally, he says, he goes, you know, I, I have seen the Japanese and their, and their innovativeness. It is no surprise to me that in the future, they may buy all of our wool and create manufacturing that will compete with us. Hmm. Wow. Yeah. It, it just, wow. I, it really becomes interesting. Now, of course, there are many things in the book that, you know, contain 19th century prejudices because, you know, he's living 160 years ago. But what's super interesting, though, is that that's why I say he was as progressive as he could be in the in the 19th century. Yes, of course. I think a lot of people uh, don't have that that sense of forgiveness for the fact that, you know, history changes everything uh, in terms of context. Um, I'm really, really fascinated by this man because, you know, I, I'm a huge um I love art. I'm an artist myself. Mm -hmm. uh, to me, I find it amazing that he was able to, you know, keep a collection. Uh, that he was also involved in the Civil War. He was a he was a, a general, is it, or a soldier or something? Well, yeah, so I, yeah. So I love this story. So connecting it back to our Civil War. So when the Civil War breaks out, uh, Charles Parsons is a part of a paramilitary group called the Wide Awakes. Now, if you think of what's happening in America right now, and it may be happening in Canada, I'm not sure, but the whole concept of woke. Yes. Okay. So that, believe it or not, we can trace the woke ideas or movements to the wide awakes of the 19th century. And what this was, was that this was a, so, so, so the Republicans of the 19th century are not the Republicans of today. In many ways, the Republican Party and the Democratic Party in the, in the United States have switched in the past 160 years. But the Wide Awakes were a, essentially, in the beginning, a Republican um, paramilitary group that wanted to stop slavery, that wanted to you know, give women the right to vote, that wanted to do all of these different things that were obviously considered progressive for the time. Um, and so Charles Parsons is in a city about 140 miles north of St. Louis in Missouri called Keokuk. And Keokuk at the time was on its way to becoming the next Chicago uh, or some other major metropolitan city. Um, Charles Parsons, while in Keokuk, would rub shoulders with a gentleman by the name of Mark Twain, you may have heard of. Yes, of course. And, and, and other famous people of that time. Well, when the war breaks out or just, you know, as it's getting underway, his brother, Louis B. Parsons, who's an attorney who had gone to Yale and Harvard and was friends with Lincoln and friends with Grant, he, he calls his brother and says, look, we just got rid of uh, a bunch of corruption in St. Louis. I need you to come to St. Louis. I need you to join the union cause because you and I are going to transform uh, the way that the federal government does business during war. And so he did, and he originally became a captain, but he uh, uh, would end up being a breveted colonel. And he and his brother, Charles Parsons and his brother, Lewis, would revamp the way the entire federal government does, does business during war. They revamped all of the uh, the railroads, they revamped the whole process of con contracting with, with suppliers. Um, it set the stage in many ways for the way the government does business with contractors now. But what happens is that um, because of the money that's saved by the, by, by the acts of Charles Parsons and Lewis Parsons, after the war is over, General Grant, uh, who's now President Grant, writes a letter and thanks both of them for saving the government millions of dollars and the ability to move, to, to give you a sense, if General Sherman was in Atlanta and sent a wire and said, Charles Parsons and Lewis Parsons, I need 40,000 men and supplies to Atlanta as soon as possible, there are numerous accounts of Charles moving 40,000 men and supplies in literally three to four days 
That's tra- incredible. Traveling four and 700 miles at a time. And obviously during war, nobody cares necessarily about the logistics of moving men and supplies. They care about the drama and the excitement of the battle itself. But you can't have a battle unless you have the infrastructure for the people to fight it. Right, of course. Um, wow. He's a, I, I understand now why you wrote a book about this, this person. <laughs> I, I find it fascinating. You mentioned his wife earlier, Martha. Was she an artist? Well, so... This is what really annoys me about being about being a researcher or a historian of the 19th century. Um, because of the status of women in the 19th century, there's very little information about her. Um, you there are there are newspaper clippings about today she hosted a tea. You know, it's like it's yeah. it, no, it's like what I, I what I want is that you know I want the women from the 19th century that behaved badly so that I can have their history. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, and so w- what's uh, what's interesting about Martha though is that um, she develops an interesting relationship with Harriet Hosmer, which I cover in the book, and I'm not going to give it away, but it's definitely worth a read because it kind of speaks to that though Charles and Martha loved each other, and that's clear from their letters, we may not know about the nuances of 19th century relationships that we might know about people in modern times. Fascinating. And, yeah, it is. It is fascinating. And so, um, it, it's uh, so one of the great mysteries, and I and I'm hoping that you know by doing shows like yours, that somebody out there in the world will hear this and go, "Oh, I've got a photo." So l- l- let me explain what I'm saying. There's no known photo of Martha Parsons anywhere in the world that I that I and I have searched close to 27 different uh, historical archives, and even though Charles named a hospital after her when she passes away in 1889 it was the martha parsons free hospital for children which would eventually become st louis children's hospital which is world renowned there's no photo of her and i have and i've looked through every known archive that's there we know that um so uh heinrich schliemann was an archaeologist of the 19th century now archaeology is, you know, not that old uh, of a science. And so essentially Heinrich Schliemann gets a lot of flack because, you know, he essentially was going on treasure hunts. But Heinrich Schliemann is credited with rediscovering Troy in Turkey. But Charles, Martha, and Heinrich Schliemann became friends on a train uh, through the Alps, around the 1860s. And what's interesting is that in the remaining letters between Heinrich Schliemann and Charles Parsons, and and by the way, if, if you're somebody who studies archaeology, you'll know exactly who Heinrich Schliemann is. Because <laughs> I don't, but I've heard the name before. <laughs> well, I, I mean, his, his discoveries really set the stage for the way that things may develop, you know, in the years to come during the 19th century regarding archaeology. But um, they were friends for over 20 years. 26 years. And so what's interesting is that we know that there existed a photo of Martha because uh, Heinrich Schliemann actually talks about it. He goes, oh, thank you, sir. I have received your letter. Uh, you know, thank you for including the, 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 the picture of your beautiful wife, Martha. So we know one existed. And I even reached out to the Heinrich Schliemann Museum in Germany and they were like, uh, nope, we don't have it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's that's got to be frustrating, right? I mean, when you're when you're doing all the research, uh, you know, on someone, and you know it's out there somewhere. It might have been burned. It might be buried somewhere. But you know that it was at least taken. Um, John, we have just a few minutes left, and I, I need to wrap this up, unfortunately, because I wish I wish we had two hours. To be honest with you, <laughs> I'm really fascinated by this topic. Um, uh, you mentioned your fascination with incense and your your research. Uh, you, you've been doing martial arts. Is that your next book? Do you think you're going to write about incense or perhaps about Japan? Well, what's interesting, so so for those who are listening or thinking about picking up the book, chapter nine covers uh, a great deal of Japanese incense history and, and the incense burner that I was talking about. Um, I've got about 27 books uh, in the queue. Uh, when, 
so so on the docket right now, I've got the audio book for, you know, the life and times of, Missouri, of Missouri's Charles Parsons between art and war. That's next. Then I've got Love and Letters in World War II, which is the it's the letters between my grandmother and my grandfather that take place over the course of about seven months while he's at sea in the South Pacific. And I discovered these after my grandfather passed away. And it's it, it just moves me to even talk about it right now. Just to read the letters between them and you're, you know, you're hearing a a, a brand new, you know, uh, mother whose husband is is in the South Pacific. It's so moving. And so um, I'm I'm trudging along on telling that story and really doing the the best honor that I can to it. Wow, I think that would make me cry to read those letters. <laughs> it you makes know, I, it makes me cry. Yeah, I, I can't even imagine. Uh, listen, John, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on on the program. You've been uh, you're an excellent storyteller, so I totally get why you do this for a living, uh, <laughs> and also I totally understand why you uh, you you've obsessed over Charles Parsons. I'm I'm very very curious about this this person. Um, and I, I'm looking forward to uh, hearing more about your, your future work. So thank you again for coming on the show. You're welcome. Can I, can I leave you with a poem that Charles Parsons wrote uh, in 1894 about Hawaii when he visited? Please do. So he writes, Fair home of flowers and fabled song, where constant is the sun's bright ray. In other lands, I'll think of thee. Aloha, Hawaii nei. From, Ka from Kauai's cliff to Loa's fires, bright land of never-ending May, farewell to all those lovely isles. Aloha o Hawaii ne. Beautiful. Thanks so much for sharing, John. Thank you, Julie. Pleasure. Thank you so much. Take care.